All right, having successfully loaded one video, what a thrill. Uh, here begins number two. And um, on, this, on this clip, I'll be talking about French Baroque art. And let me remind you that the final category on the last list of works that you received, the final category of French Baroque art, which I had said earlier, we would not cover before the second midterm exam. I am restoring to um, the body material we will cover. And I will do this in two class meetings. Uh, I'll talk now about French Baroque painting, and subsequently about the Palace of Versailles, that, um, that important and, and large construction project. Uh, so the Baroque in France, this is the last um, national style that we'll be talking about. I think there are two important cultural developments to mention. The first of those is the, uh, the establishment of the Bourbon dynasty. Uh, this is, um, this would be the, really the last dynasty in the history of uh, the French monarchy. It began around 1590 with Henry IV, and uh, he was assassinated then in 1610. His son, Louis XIII, ruled, and uh, subsequently from 1643 on, well into the uh, following century, uh, Louis XIV, the Sun King, was the ruler of France. Uh, particularly under the rule of Louis XIV, the French monarchy uh, it uh, increased enormously in political importance and in cultural importance. French style was imitated all over Europe. The French language was spoken at, at courts other than, uh, than, than that of France itself. And uh, the French monarchy was the primary patron of art in, um, in France. We've already encountered one major work uh, commissioned by um, the French court, and that is the Marie de Medici series that the widow of Henry IV, Marie de Medici, uh, commissioned from Peter Paul Rubens. And you'll recall that was a big uh, series of paintings, about 24, that uh, chronicled the life of Marie de Medici and glorified her in the most extravagant way. Um, the other major cultural development to mention is that of the establishment of the, uh, of the, the Academy Royale, uh, the, the Academy of Art under the patronage of the, uh, of the French court. Uh, we haven't talked about this much before, but uh, as, a, as a kind of result of the Renaissance, uh, the increased importance placed on the arts and, and artists, individual artists, and the uh, the contribution they might make to the cultures of their, uh, their societies. Uh, academies were established for the first time in Florence in 16, 1560 and subsequently Rome in 1583. And what uh, an academy did was to raise the status of painting above that of the, the other crafts. Um, we talked about the trade guilds that um, uh, that were important in the Renaissance and involved in the commissioning of works of art. Painting was one of those guilds. But uh, with the establishment of, cate of, of academies, painting was raised to the status of an intellectual art. Of course, using one's hands, the skills that uh, the, hands, uh, um, the hands enact, that's still important. But uh, with, with the academic recognition, painting was thought of as first intellectual. Uh, and uh, an academy was established in France in uh, 1648 uh, for the first time for painting. Uh, and then it was reorganized in 1661 under the patronage of Louis XIV. Uh, academic standing was a kind of double-edged sword for artists because while it gave painting and uh, sculpture greater social prestige, it brought to members of the academies, um, they brought them uh, prestigious commissions, um, recognition of a lofty sort. Uh, it also made the academy a kind of tool of the French monarchy, uh, one that might um, serve as a, a very effective means of, uh, of, 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 of creating propaganda. 
in the form of paintings and sculptures that would glorify the king. Um, either directly, in the case of, let's say, an equestrian statue that shows the king on horseback, or, or perhaps indirectly, uh, in a painting of, let's say, Alexander the Great, um, the, the Greek king, who was understood to be a kind of predecessor, a kind of uh, analogous figure to Louis XIV himself. Uh, so we'll mention the Academy a number of times. I'm going to switch to images now. We're going to look first at, bear with me for a minute. We're going to look at this work by Georges de la Tour. Now we've talked again and again about the influence of Caravaggio. Uh, his influence was seen in the works of um, Velazquez and in Spain, yeah, people like Halls uh, and, and Rembrandt, the Utrecht Caravaggisti in, in uh, the Dutch Republic, and, and here uh, in the work of Georges de Latour, who was the, the primary emulator of the style of Caravaggio in France. Uh, we don't know that he traveled to, to Rome and saw works of Caravaggio directly. It's thought that uh, he may have picked up this influence through the works of the Utrecht Caravaggisti, who had been to Rome and then returned to Utrecht in the Dutch Republic. Uh, Georges Latour was from um, Lorraine in the uh, northeast of France. Um, He painted religious subjects primarily. He was also a member of the French Academy, uh, the, one of the original members, the founding members of the Academy, I should mention. And we're looking on the screen at a typical example of his work. This is entitled Adoration of the Shepherds. It dates from 1645 to 1650. Uh, so what we're looking at is uh, a, a nativity scene. Uh, Mary is seen on the left-hand side. The infant Jesus is there in the center. And Joseph on the right and the shepherds are visiting in the middle. Uh, but you'll notice there are, there are no halos, and the figures altogether, they're shown as commonplace figural types. They're not idealized. Um, the, um, the presentation here is very intimate. Uh, the figures are gathered together in a, in a, in a way that, um, that, that conveys both physical closeness but also emotional intimacy. Uh, and they're close to the picture plane so that we really feel a part of the circle surrounding the infant Jesus. Now, just as with the Utrecht Caravaggisti, whose work diverged from that of Caravaggio somewhat, this does too in that the painting is, clearly takes place at night uh, and uh, the light source is shown. The light source is a candle, which is um, shielded from us by uh, Joseph on the right-hand side. Notice the lovely effect uh, of the light passing in between his fingers and illuminating the, the, the very narrow space in between, the, the, the narrow gaps in between the fingers. The light seems to reflect um, with, with uh, sort of hyper brilliance, with greater than normal brilliance off of the infant Jesus wrapped up in uh, swaddling clothes. Um, in a way that gives him a kind of special, uh, a special character and, and suggests, suggests maybe that some of this light is coming from him. Notice that the palette of colors is all warm. Um, there are oranges and reds and browns and yellows. Um, the background, of course, is um, fades into utter blackness. So we have the strong light and dark contrast that are typical Caravaggio. Uh, another feature of um, de la Tour's style is that um, he, he will simplify forms so that notice the, the, the shape of Mary's head, the smoothness of her cheeks, and the, the large expanses of unmodulated drapery where you see just one color, no wrinkles, so that the, the form is, is simpler than it might, uh, might, we might expect it to be. Uh, and the net, net effect of this is um, a painting that is that is uh, emotionally warm uh, uh, and conveys a sense of, of calmness, of stillness, of, of quiet. All right, we're looking here at a uh, an early work of Nicholas Poussin, and of all the painters I'm going to mention, and that won't be very many, but of all the painters I might mention, 
in talking even more broadly about French Baroque art, Poussin is clearly the most important. Um, and this is somewhat ironic because Poussin lived most of his life outside of France uh, in Rome. He went there um, in his 20s. And except for uh, one or two return trips to France, he remained throughout his career in, uh, in Rome. There in the, the, cr the cradle of cl classical antiquity where he could see uh, surviving works of, of ancient statuary and study the works of um, Raphael and Michelangelo, Raphael especially, also Nivole Caracci had a strong influence on him. Uh, Poussin uh, did not paint frescoes, did not paint wall or ceiling paintings, but rather easel paintings that were um, of moderate size, at most maybe five, maybe six feet long at the very most. Uh, but he painted for many French patrons. Uh, and so his works ended up back in France and his influence was, was strongly felt in the, in the guidelines, in the notion of ideal artistic style that was formulated within the institution of the French Academy. Uh, he would have a strong influence on French art for centuries thereafter. All right, the early work that we're looking here uh, is called Et in Arcadia Ego. And your textbook mentions that Poussin did a couple of versions of this. I'll show you here both versions simultaneously. Uh, the version we're seeing on the left-hand side is an example of his earlier work. And this dates from um, about 1629. And uh, we'll go back to it. And it shows us the influence of Titian, especially on him. Um, notice that the What's happening here is that a group of shepherds who live in, um, in, in a, a, a Arcadia, which is a kind of mythic uh, land of happiness and plenty, they're discovering a, a sarcophagus in the, in the, in the forest. And, and they're tracing their hands over the inscription on it and trying to figure out what it means. Uh, what they're discovering is that even in this this land of, of happiness and bliss that death exists. And this will, um, uh, this will lead to, this will bring a kind of note of melancholy and sadness to their otherwise blissful lives. Uh, you'll notice that the, the, the overall tonality here is golden. Uh, the, the coffin is positioned at an oblique angle, leading us into distant space. Um, I, I, now, I mention these things because the work in your textbook, which was painted a good bit later, a couple decades later in 1655, shows a quite a strong transformation in style. And here is that work, the second version of Et in Arcadia Ego. What's happened is that the light has become more evenly diffused and the composition is, um, um, it is more stable, uh, more centered, more balanced than the earlier version with the coffin now centered in the exact center of the painting, turned at a slight angle to the picture plane rather than a sharp angle. And the four figures present are arranged in a balanced way, one might almost say a symmetrical way around it. Uh, notice that the four figures with their four heads, the heads are echoed in the shapes of the trees in the distance. So that we see a resonance between the figures and the landscape. Now, the figures include, it seems, three shepherds, and a single female figure who looks like um, a kind of ancient goddess or an ancient muse. Uh, she is thought to be uh, a personification of death. And she claps her hands in a kind of somber way over, the, um, over the, the shoulder of one of the men as he looks toward her. Again, they're discovering uh, that death exists in the world, in their world, and this, this uh, prompts them to, to to ponder its meaning and its place, and to uh, uh, and, and a change in their attitude. The, the, notice that the personification of death aligns with trees in the background, so they have a kind of vertical armature that runs through the painting, uh, connected to the group of figures that surround the uh, sarcophagus. Uh, you're going to see here in another works by Poussin that he uses colors as Anibale Caracci did before him and Raphael before him in part in a way to separate the figures one from another so that um, 
We've got here a golden garment standing in contrast to the red garment on the adjacent figure, and likewise a contrast between the sort of pinkish garment and the blue garment next to it. Uh, it's thought that some of the poses, this pose in particular, was modeled on an ancient statue. Uh, so we're looking here at a, at, a, at a highly classical style. It's based on, um, on um, uh, a, a close study of, of, um, of earlier works, works of statuary from antiquity and works of um, uh, Renaissance masters such as Raphael. A work that's not in your textbook but I want to add because I think it's quite revealing is this work on the screen now, which is called The Abduction or the Rape of the Sabine Women. And this dates from 1633 to 1634. Uh, it's one of the earliest examples of Poussin's mature style, a style that deviates from that which we saw in that earlier work, um, that early version of Et in Arcadia Ego. Now in mid-career, Poussin was sick for a period of time and he made notes for a treatise on painting which he never completed. But what he tried to define in this treatise is what he called the grand manner, la maniera magnifica. Um, and, and he says that to paint in the grand manner, this is something he aspired to do. Uh, one must choose great subjects, subjects of a grandiose nature, such as battles, heroic actions, and religious themes. So we see an example here of a, of a, of a battle, a battle of the, that's, that's quite important, and I'll explain why in a minute. He says that minute details should be avoided, and that one should also avoid low subjects, vulgar subjects, such as a genre painter might represent. He said the subject should be represented in an impressive way, based on thorough study. So a, a, a large finished painting like this might uh, culminate uh, the creation of many studies of individual figures and groups of figures, and, and the working out of the composition as a whole. Uh, and that um, this, the, the great subject chosen by the painter should be rendered with moderation and restraint. So that while a battle is going on here, notice that we don't see bloodshed and, and, and uh, entrails spilling out of the ground, but um, the tumult of the battle is shown more through gesture and through facial expressions. Uh, Poussin admired the Greek musical modes. And what he said about them was that they produced marvelous effects uh, that uh, expressed emotional states clearly. And so he tried to develop what he called a modal theory of painting. Um, now what this means is that, uh, that given the nature of a particular subject, if it was violent on the one hand or sweet on the other, you would choose uh, artistic effects that um, would bring out the emotional content of that subject. Uh, and he gave these different sets of effects, different uh, uh, representational techniques, the names of the Greek musical modes. Uh, it's thought that this painting would be in what he called the Phrygian mode. And this was a mode that he said was appropriate for frightful wars, a vehement, furious, and highly severe mode. But what we're seeing as the subject here is a, uh, uh, um, an event in the early history, probably legendary history of Rome. And the story is this, that the Roman men, Rome was a, a first on, uh, to be, in the beginning, a male settlement, uh, and they failed to attract women to, to marry, to take as wives, to bear them children, to perpetuate the community. And so eventually they resorted to a trick. They invited the Sabines, living in a nearby community to um, in an athletic contest. And then on a signal from the Roman leader Romulus, the other Romans picked up their weapons and they took the Sabine women captive and they um, fought off the Sabine men who tried to resist this action. And so we see that very thing happening here. This is Romulus, clothed in red. Notice that he alone wears a brilliant red. And he clutches his cloak and he holds it up. And going on down below then is the struggle for control of the Sabine women um, involving the Romans trying to take them captive and the Sabines trying to, to retain uh, possession of them as daughters and wives. Um, we've got little groups fighting here. So here, for example, this is presumably a Roman 
uh, male and the Sabine uh, man who is struggling against him, but, but seemingly losing in this fight, and the Sabine women below uh, that the that Roman is trying to take captive. Here another little episode. You'll notice that the figures throughout are idealized. The men are muscular, the women are well proportioned. Um, so the representation of the figure is based on careful study of ancient classical idealized examples. Um, there's a background here, a, a kind of grid of horizontals and verticals, which is establishes a, 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 a setting, uh, but also a kind of um, a foundation for what goes in on front. So we see over here what looks like part of the temple, the columns of the temple. Here are the pilasters and the entablature of a basilica, a Roman public meeting hall. Uh, and in front of that, you'll notice that virtually all the figures are on a diagonal. But it's a diagonal that really is made up of its own grid, the one that is turned at about a 45 degree angle to the background grid of horizontals and verticals. So here, for example, the horse is on a uh, a 45 degree angle to the background grid. Likewise, this pair of male um, uh, 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 males fighting. The upraised arms, gestures, and the weapons uh, are, are, are at a 45 degree angle, um, inclined the other way. So we have that here, and here, and here, and so on. So it's, it's one grid essentially turned against the background grid. But notice that the colors are scattered throughout the painting to lead us from one figural group to another. So here we have a blue, a blue again, blue, blue, blue. And those blues are set against contrasting colors. So that over here, uh, there's a kind of orangish color next to the blue. Now these are complementaries or opposites, and they um, intensify one another. There's a reddish color next to a green. Again, these are complementaries as well. They're not pure examples. Uh, they're not vivid examples of those colors, but rather dull versions of those colors as appropriate, I suppose, for a battle scene rather than something sweet and serene in character. So this is an example of, uh, uh, it would seem, of uh, 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 Poussin's modal theory of painting. Now again, this is all explained in a treatise which he never completed, and he never identified uh, one painting or another as, as exemplifying one mode or another, but if we put these things together, I think we're drawing reasonable conclusions. Uh, the Rape of the Sabines, or Abduction of the Sabines, a painting in the Phrygian mode. Uh, Poussin also painted landscapes, but these are landscapes in that classical landscape tradition. That is an idealized landscape. And you'll remember that we talked about one earlier example of this in the work of Nivele Karachi and his landscape with a flight to Egypt. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the burial of Fossillon by Poussin. Um, and notice that uh, in keeping with the classical landscape conventions, there are trees that frame the view into the distance. Uh, there are focal points scattered uh, from foreground into the middle ground into the far distance. Uh, the space is also broken up by patterns of light and shadow. So we're led to look from one thing to another. Um, The main subject, there is a subject here, and that is, as I said, the burial of Phocion. Now, Phocion was a, a, Greek, um, uh, a Greek military leader, a general, who was falsely accused of treason. Uh, he was denied burial in, a, in, in the kind of grand way that he really deserved. Uh, and we see that grand burial here represented by a sarcophagus in the distance, directly above Phocion himself. But Phocion is, is being taken out of the city. This is supposed to represent Athens by a couple of his loyal followers. And so the, the, the very modest burial that he will get, perhaps just simply put into the ground, is juxtaposed uh, with the, the grand burial of someone in a sarcophagus there in the distance. So uh, it's primarily landscape, uh, and yet there is a narrative element within it, and that's generally true of classical landscape paintings. Uh, there is one other really important landscape painter um, from 17th century France, although again, like Poussin, 
he spent his career in, in, in Rome, uh, where he was, his paintings were uh, highly sought after by uh, patrons, uh, including popes and, and, and aristocrats. Uh, and that is Claude Lorrain. Now the name Lorrain is a nickname. His, his real name was Claude Gallet. He was from Lorraine. I'm pronouncing the N here. Um, the, the name of the province he was from. Uh, but he's referred to as Claude Lorrain. I'm not saying the N in this case. He was called, he's called that, and you'll see him referred to as Claude or Claude Lorrain or just Lorrain. Um, all these names refer to the same painter. He lived a long life between about 1600 and 1682. Uh, uh, interestingly, he first went to Rome as a pastry cook, as a very young man, but then switched to painting. And uh, he developed then a very successful uh, painting career, uh, painting classical landscapes, as you can see here in this example on the screen, this is in your textbook. And I remind you, this is called Landscape with Cattle and Peasants. So as the title indicates, there is no, there's no narrative embedded within this. Um, we're seeing simply shepherds or, or cow herds gathered together on the right hand side of the painting. They're uh, engaging in conversation while the cows are grouped together on the left hand side of the painting. Uh, but clearly landscape dominates. And in the classical landscape tradition, we have a, here a big bank of trees that, that partially closes our view up into the distance, framing trees on the margins of the painting, and then an open view uh, framed by these trees that allow us to see into the middle ground where there is a body of water and cattle crossing it, and finally distant mountains which um, uh, fade away into atmospheric perspective in the far distance. Um, it's a, it's a beautifully constructed landscape. Uh, and the eye is led gradually, gently from this broad foreground around the corner into the distance. Um, the, the style of, 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 of Claude of, or Claude Laram would be uh, very influential on later painters and even on um, landscape architecture. And so I want to show you an example of this here in this English landscape garden. Um, now we're going to be talking subsequently about French, the French landscape garden, as exemplified by Versailles. In the 18th century, the English developed a very different style of gardening, which is um, more natural in appearance, but it idealizes nature, uh, much the way you see in paintings by Claude Lorraine. Trees are placed strategically to frame beautiful views, and uh, just as we have uh, well, particularly, uh, not so clear, maybe, maybe here, uh, a temple or a classical building in the distance as a focal point. Here in the English landscape garden is a temple-like structure in the distance, a bridge um, of, of, of quite beautiful shape, appealing shape in the foreground. And notice that the uh, body of water is not rectangular, as we're going to see at Versailles. It's not geometric in shape, but it has uh, uh, sweeping natural curves that, that lead the eye in and out and eventually to that, that uh, focal point in the distance. Uh, here is one other painting by Claude Lorraine, which is not in your textbook. This is on your list, and this is called uh, The Embarkation of the Queen of Sheba. And I add this here because this is something that, um, this is an innovation of, of, of Claude's, uh, and that is a uh, a harbor scene or port scene within the classical landscape tradition. Now in this case, there is a, a narrative included within the work, and that is, the, as the title indicates, the leaving of the Queen of Sheba. Uh, she is somebody who visits um, King David in the Old Testament. And you can see that's going on here. Here she is leaving a palatial building on the right-hand side with her retinue grouped around her and her um, her various belongings, trunks of clothing, are being loaded into boats, which will carry both people and objects out to a waiting ship in the harbor. Now you'll notice that this scene has not been put together with archaeological accuracy. This is not a, a, an Old Testament era building, but it's a 
Baroque era palace. Uh, there is a classical ruin over here on the left hand side. Uh, Claude was more concerned with giving a sense of majesty and magnificence to whatever the subject might be. And so he borrowed architecture from different periods in history rather, rather freely. Uh, we have also a lighthouse that appears in the distance. It looks like maybe another palace or castle in the far distance. Um, so they, they function like trees to frame the human activity, frame the view into distant space, which is marked off by um, reflections across the water. You get closer and closer together as you look toward the rising sun. So it seems that this journey uh, begins at the break of day. And um, just as the journey holds all kinds of uh, possibilities for um, eventful occurrences, um, meetings, um, who knows? But you know, we always approach a journey with expectation, with excitement, with anticipation. Um, the, the, the day begins uh, as a kind of an analogous, um, um, uh, analogous event in, 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 in the cycle of day and night. Uh, and, 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 and likewise, a day holds all kinds of possibilities that, uh, that, that, that lie ahead uh, as something that, that, that we also might anticipate with, with eagerness and, and, uh, and so a sense of, of excitement. All right, the last work we're going to see here um, is by Hyacinthe Rigaud. Rigaud is the last name. Uh, and we're looking at a portrait of Louis XIV. We'll be turning to his palace at Versailles here shortly. So um, you might put together here the image of the king with the castle that we'll see later uh, on the next video. This work dates from 1701. So it takes us into the very beginning of the 18th century and toward the end of Louis the 14th reign. Um, he would have been about 63 years of age when this work was done. Uh, and notice that we're looking here in terms of portrait format at a full length um, portrait that shows the figure standing. The work is large in size. And I'm gonna look up the dimensions just to be certain. Nine feet in height. So the king is shown about life size, perhaps even a little larger than life size. Uh, clearly the artist's intent here was to to glorify the king, to show him uh, powerful, linked to tradition, um, manly, um, a leader of armies, all those things that we associate with, uh, with royal power, and especially with him. Um, so th there are uh, lots of different conventions of portraiture included, some of which we saw earlier in looking at the depiction of Charles the second, Charles the first or second, I forget which, uh, in hunting dress, Charles the first in hunting dress by Anthony Van Dyke. Remember that was also a full length portrait. Um, here the representation of power is much more explicit than in the rather subtle way that, that uh, Van Dyke did it. There is a cloth of honor uh, that, uh, that, that shields the king in a kind of honorific way a sumptuous, um, um, rich red fabric. Uh, it seems that we're looking into the hall of mirrors in the distance. And uh, in the foreground is a enormous column. Uh, so the, the architectural fragments that we see suggest a big, magnificent palatial environment. And on the base of that column is a relief that shows uh, the personification of justice. Now the king, acted as a judge and decided um, life and death sentences and the like on occasion. So that refers to one of the uh, kinds of authority held by the king. Uh, he is holding a baton and uh, there's a scepter here as well. And I, these are associated with, um, um, with earlier kings in French history. He's wearing uh, an urban, ermine lined robe and we see the lilies of the the, the, the Bourbon dynasty uh, all over the outside as well as the chest. Uh, 
There's a crown, by the way, on the chest as well. Uh, the sword, which hangs around his waist, suggests military authority, military leadership. And of course, he stands in classical contrapposto with the distant leg bearing the weight of the body and the foreleg bent at the knee and the heel raised off the ground a little bit. Notice he's wearing red heels. Uh, this was a, a kind of honorific that he created along with lots of other little, uh, that they might appear to us as rather superficial indications of status. Uh, but he was successful in kind of defining layers of status um, in the court of Versailles and in having um, the various aristocrats that gathered there kind of fighting each other to, uh, to, to, to aspire to um, these tokens of recognition. When I saw this at the Louvre years ago, uh, I looked upon it for some period of time, and I noticed that the, the, the uh, reflection of the light off of the surface of the canvas, it was different in a rectangle that included the face. And eventually I, I, I realized quite clearly that the face was painted separately from all of the rest of the painting, and that the, these two pieces of canvas were put together. So most likely, uh, Louis modeled for the face, and um, the artist may have gotten a couple sittings, may have gotten an, an hour or two of his time, and so uh, um, captured a likeness on that, that small area, maybe a foot in height of canvas. And then that was fitted into, that was stitched into uh, the rest of the painting, a second piece of canvas, that contained everything else. And all the, all the rest of it then was, um, was put together, was assembled in the studio in order to glorify the king in the extraordinary way that we see here. All right, from the king then, it's only natural that we talk about Versailles next. 